In a moment, I'm going to turn the mic over to Brooke O'Hara, who is scrambling for a seat up here, who's, go, who's a, a dear friend, an old friend uh, of Ross Gay, and is going to introduce him with, I hope, some spicy personal anecdotes from college days together. Um, but I'm Al Filreis, the faculty director. Ross, come on in. This is Ross Gay, everybody. Here he is. Uh, we're really, really just so excited that Ross is here. It's a thing that, like, I guess about six months ago we came up with it, and we're really glad it came off. Um, so we, uh, we have copies of Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, which is, uh, as you will find out from book, an award-winning book, National Book Critics Circle. One less yeah. <laughs> and a finalist for the National Book Award, and... Uh, nominee for the NAACP Image Award and all that other stuff. Anyway, it's an award-winning book. It's a fantastic book. And we have some copies of this, not enough for everybody, so you'll have to scramble to get a copy, and I'm sure Ross would be agreeable if you buy a copy of the book that he'll inscribe it for you afterwards. Um, this program is an annual program that's um, endowed so that we will always have a poetry program like this every year by uh, the uh, Sussman and Morse family, Evo and Eva and Leo Sussman. Um, we honor the memory of Eva and Leo, who are the grandparents of Dan Morse. Uh, and Dan's children attended Penn, um, and uh, Dan's mother, Naomi, who's a writer, reader, poet, and painter. The F Sussman Morse family has enabled this program. So, and they are unable to be here. To, they're always here, but they weren't able to do it tonight. Uh, but they are watching the video, uh, and so this is our chance to put our hands together and thank them for making poetry possible. <laughs> also, this afternoon um, at 4 o'clock, uh, Ross joined Joe Park and Herman Beavers and myself for an episode of Poem Talk, which we made a video of. And we talked about a poem by Patrick Rosal. Uh, and uh, a book called Brooklyn Antediluvian, and so we will make sure that people who are here tonight get word of that recording when it's available. It's a really good discussion, and some of you were here for that. Okay, so after the reading, we will go into the dining room for a really good reception, food and drink. We hope a lot of you will stay and get a chance to meet Ross. He's a really great guy. And now, a senior lecturer in the theater arts program and f dear friend of Writer's House and of me, Brooke O'Hara, she will introduce Ross. Here's Brooke. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Al, for having Ross and Jessica, for coordinating everything. And Ross, thank you for coming. I'm so thrilled to be introduced. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. To be introducing Ross, who is a poet, a gardener, an SAS and one of my best friends in this world. Um, so I'm going to give you a less, a less lengthy rundown of his accomplishments <laughs> because Al told me to rush it. Um, no, not really. And uh, he wrote three, three books of poetry, the first one, Against Witch, which, is pro which was published by Coven Carey Press, Oh, is <laughs> I just thought it was mine, that's all. Um, Bringing Down the Shovel by University of Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, and Catalog of Unabashed, Unabashed Gratitude. I don't know why they got caught up. And then he also has an essay, Some Thoughts on Mercy, which I recommend everybody read in The Sun magazine. You can find it online. And the awards you didn't mention is this year he got the Kingsley Tufts Award for the same book, right? Is it for a book? Okay, and he also had the Radcliffe Fellowship and the Guggenheim Fellowship. Um, he's also, and this is the thing about Ross, is he's a spectacular artist and an incredibly generous friend, but I think he's a generous collaborator. And so he also is the founding editor of a sports magazine online called Some Call It Ballin, which is really incredible. And I, I ask you should all take a look at it. And he's the editor of two chapbook presses, Q Avenue and 
Ledge Mule Press. Um, and he's also the founding member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, which is an incredible place. And when you hear his reading, I'm sure he'll read some about the orchard or about his relationship to gardening or fruit. <laughs> and um, I, when this book came out, he held his own book party in Bloomington that I went to, and he used the book party to raise thousands of dollars for this orchard. And he actually like sold his books super cheap in exchange for people to volunteer at the orchard. And there were hundreds of people at it. And I was just like really impressed at what an incredible citizen he was and is. Um, the other thing about Ross, which is also, if you know his work, you know this, but he has so much grace in his writing. Like he's so capable of sharing like joy and pleasure and at the same time intertwining like pain and misery and sorrow in this way that you, that it allows everyone to sort of feel and open up and indulge in all the paradoxes of our world. And um, so, and the, the other thing about Ross is he's a rabble rouser. <laughs> I've known him since I was 19 years old and he's kind of been my best friend since then and he's provoked me to do things that I'm still embarrassed about. <laughs> and he, um, and I kind of have been thinking about this, like how do I describe Ross? Like he loves performance, performance but he also loves kind of make-believe. So he had me come once to like te to his class at Temple to pretend to be a really bad student on the first day of class. And then when I showed up, he had our friend come to pretend to be him. And so we had the whole first class as not some other person who was Ross Gay, who looks nothing like Ross Gay and who had toilet paper hanging out of his pants. <laughs> He also had a satirical newspaper at our school called The Toilet Paper, which he convinced to me to write an article for that then the entire faculty of our college was mad at me for an entire year. Um, and, then he, he, and then he convinced me to be on a television show with him. Like back in early reality television, it was a blind date. He <laughs> pretended... He, he first of all signed up for the show as his friend Jason, who was an emergency room intern at the time at Temple Hospital and had no free time. And when the show accepted us, they, Ross was like, oh, Jason, you signed Brooke and I up for a blind date. And then he went on to like tell me to do all these things that clearly put me in an awkward position where one of the first things I had to say to him on camera was, I didn't think you'd be black. <laughs> and... One of the uh, he gave me a hand puppet of a unicorn that he told me to wear the entire date, <laughs> and this and the producers were going crazy during the date, and he made us only talk about like art and science and nothing like good for reality television. It was like completely <laughs> uneditable, um, and the producers were going crazy. At one point, they were like, "Can you please take that puppet off?" <laughs> and and they. So this is the kind, and then, so I started to think, what is our relationship other than best friend and good colleague and collaborator? But I think I'm his sidekick. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you for coming, and Ross Gay. Thanks, Brooke. Um, that's bullshit. <laughs> I was thinking, because someone had asked me recently, like, how did you come around to writing poems or whatever? Because <clears throat> I didn't do that when I first was a young person, a very young person. And I, you know, I was going to fail out of college, actually. I played football at Lafayette College. I was on the cusp of failing out. And I had a professor who introduced me to some poems my sophomore year of college. <clears throat> but then I thought recently, it wasn't only that, that was exactly the time that I met Brooke. And so I sort of had this, my imaginative horizon sort of changed. It changed by being introduced to um, Amiri Baraka's poems, but it also changed because I met Brooke and there was like this way of sort of thinking about making stuff. <clears throat> Brooke had all the good ideas about that dating story on TV. So that's 
completely false what she told it. It was everything was her idea. Um, so I'm writing these things called. It's so good to be here. Goddamn, I'm so happy. I didn't even look up. Um, you know, I read here before in like 1998. Hey Ryan, um, it was a long, a long ass time ago. It was around the time that we were faking out students at undergraduates at Temple, um, which is such a weird thing to do. <coughs> anyway, um, I'm writing, it's really good to be here. I'm writing these little um, things I'm calling delights. And delights, they're short essays. Someone called them essayettes, so I'm calling them essayettes now. Um, <coughs> I'm going to read you a couple of these. But first, I'm going to read this poem called Ode to the Mistake. I'll ask to hear this poem, so I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. This is a poem sort of about an actual mistake I made, which was to take LSD before going to like a reunion for the, the, the gifted and talented kids. Um, so like, and I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't do anything like that. And, but here it was. I thought it was a good idea to take a bunch of acid. And then go hang out. I'm also talking about teaching, <coughs> which is like being on acid. <laughs> to the mistake. It is good to know a thing or two about that of which you speak, or even to be expert, which is not requisite, though a thing or two is good. Like the prop plane I know is going to land on the canvas roof of my friend's rickety Jeep while the salutatorian-to-be sits in the back seat, giddy with her new graphing calculator. And the driver says something, I think, about Arsenio Hall. Do you all remember? <laughs> Arsenio Hall. And he sounds like a bunny in an echo chamber. But it's hard to hear with those propellers roaring above. And today, I am lecturing on the miracle of the mistake in a poem, that hiccup or weird gift that spirals or jettisons what's dull and landlocked into as yet untraversed, i.e. cosmic. I overuse this metaphor with my students' grounds. I tell this to 105, give or take, undergrads who mostly don't care and wrestle second to second that by now blood-borne drive to check their beckoning phones, which mostly, bless them, they don't. The mistake, I say, is a gift. Don't be afraid. See what it teaches you about what the poem can be. I know of what I speak, like the two tabs of very potent, evidently, acid I dropped four hours before this reunion and graduation party of sorts. For we, the gifted and talented, Corn chips and Mr. Pib and store-bought cookies, the texture of which sunk me knee-deep in a desert. I imagine I looked something like an opaque cloud that day when Mr. and Mrs. Simonoski, our brainy hosts and teachers, guffawed in claymation. The tremendous bead of spit balancing on Mr. Simonoski's lip before gust of air lifted it. And it drifted to the coarse fabric of his beard all the spiny hairs of which seemed to screech like crickets. And no wonder I declined the invitation from the volleyball court, although I was a phys ed major, and beneath the white arcs the ball painted in the sky. My cl classmates Lisa and Eugene and Ick and Becky all looked a bit alien with craniums engorged slightly and spines compressed, if not even serpentine, their limbs flailing about wildly like cuttlefish, speaking only in polysyllabics, which must have made my breathy grunts all the more apish. Who knows where the poem will lead you? I tell them to let go their reins and listen to the tongue's half-wit brilliance, the corner of the mind made light by some accidental yoking of two impossibly joined things. One or two in the rear, I notice their eyes roll into the backs of their heads. And my plastic cup of root beer by now is spilling a bit while Mr. Simonoski laughs like a hyena plunging its face in a ruptured gut. And nothing has ever been as clear to me as the bell that rang in my head that day. We were a 12-year experiment. 
The garden variety brainiacs from a suburban school, passable genetic mixture, forgettable location, Mr. Sims' oddly large eyes and long reptilian tail now making sense. And the way someone with an electric can opener voice seemed always to be inside him, speaking when he spoke, now making sense. As the night winds down and the last of the cake is served writhing with some fluorescent scrawl, only I seem to be able to read while all the good-natured kids whose fingernails are chewed raw and jaws pulse who are so good, so very good, and soon will be hauled into the bottomless sky under which I stumble to see what direction they're coming from, and can I run? Thank you. Um... This is, yeah, so I'm going to read this little short thing. This is called, this is really new. I'm going to read this one. This is really new. Really, really new. It's called, That's Some Bambi Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Quoth my buddy Pat, when I told him, told him about the guy who told me and Stephanie as we were walking the dog around the cemetery, our little cat Daisy following behind Disney shit, yes, but not yet the Bambi shit. Pushing his lawnmower, a hefty belly hanging over his belt, wrapped tight in a three-quarter sleeve ACDC t-shirt, camo hat with the gas station, razor-style shades perched atop the brim, slightly mottled pink skin, when somehow the family of deer in the neighborhood came up. And he mentioned that not only had he seen them, he'd become friends with them, such that sometimes he'd be working in a shed, getting his mower tuned up, grabbing a tool, and the little fawn would come right in and rub up against him like a big old dog, really, until I'd have to shove him out. Get now, get. And one time I was working back there and started getting lightheaded, and I didn't know I had sugar, but I started feeling real bad and started walking toward the house. And the next thing you know, I woke up with both of those deer, the mama and her baby, licking my face all over my cheeks and eyes till I realized I'd passed out. And I said, okay, okay, that's enough now, and got up and got me some pop. <clears throat> this is called tap tap in the time tap tap in the time of Trump. Given as the official unofficial policy of one of the candidates for president is in all likelihood a kind of sped up extermination of black people, the already extant unofficial policy. I take it as no small gesture of solidarity and more to the point love when the brother working as a flight attendant, maybe about 50 the beginning of gray in his fade, his American Airlines vest snug on his sturdily built torso, walking backward in front of the cart after putting my seltzer on my tray table said, there you go, man, and tapped my arm twice. Tap, tap. Oh, let me never cease extolling the virtues and my adoration of the warranted familiarity. You see family in that world, word, don't you family? Expressed by a look or tone of voice, or today on this airplane between Indianapolis and Charlotte, those are real places, lest we forget. And a tap, two, tap, tap, on the tricep. By which it's really a kind of miracle was expressed a social and bodily intimacy on this airplane, <clears throat> at this moment in history. Our particular bodies, making the social contract of mostly not touching each other irrelevant or rather writing a little addendum which acknowledges the aforementioned official policy, which is also a kind of de facto and terrible touching of non-white bodies, black bodies in particular. The state always touching some of us, or trying to, always figuring out ways to keep touching us like that. And this flight attendant, tap, tap, reminding like that simply, remember, tap, to how else we might be touched and are. There you go, man. Um, I want to read you one more of these. <clears throat> There's one. Um, oh, this is called transplanting. Today, I have smuggled three fig cuttings onto a flight from Philadelphia to Detroit. Truth be told, no smuggling has occurred, given as I was carrying the things open and notorious in a plastic bag. Their roots were, themselves, in a plastic bag stuck into some moist compost and leaves. But smuggling makes the act feel a bit more thrilling than what it seems, carrying a few sticks in a bag. 
and therefore more like what it is, cloning a living creature for replanting about 700 miles away. Which, you might have already gone there, given as I've told you already, it's a fig tree, is another way of saying I'm carrying joy around in my bag. Actually, right now, it's in the overhead compartment in that plastic bag, probably a little bit funky with my dirty clothes. This is one of those delights that keeps piling up. Given as the fig tree I took these cuttings from, don't forget the living things in my plastic bag up top, which is firmly established and easily my height in my partner's mother's backyard in Frenchtown, New Jersey, is from a grove of figs a bit further down the Delaware in Langhorn, PA, where my best friend Jay's family lived and where his father grew a wonderful garden, including bitter melon, Asian pears, peaches, ang choy, and yes, these figs. When I first asked if I could transplant some of his figs, he was moving and I was heartbroken that the garden would no longer be a sanctuary to me. He said yes, if he even said that. Walked me out to the grove of figs beneath his massive chestnut tree and he picked up a pickaxe and started hacking at the thing. I was a little terrified, green, green thumb that I was. Two ancillary delights. I have all these like long parentheticals in here, so you have to bear with me with this. Two ancillary delights. Mr. Lau, old school, OG, actually got a turtle, put a little hole in its shell, tied a string to a nut about the whole size, which he then dropped into that hole, tying the other end of the string to a stick in the middle of his lettuces so that he could have a steady, if coerced, slug patrol. Got it? That's not the delight. <clears throat> The delight is that his son, my pal Jay, who is also on the dating story, my pal Jay, under cover of night, dislodged the nut from the shell, carried the critter on his bike, one-handed, no helmet, to a nearby tributary of Neshaminy Creek, the Little Things River Jordan. Ancillary delight too, perhaps with a twinge of irony, when people say they have a black thumb, meaning they can't grow anything, I say, hmm. Then we stuck them, so we're back in the thing again. Then we stuck them in a bucket full of water, and he did in fact tell me not to let them dry out. Yesterday, when I dug these ones up, I used a shovel and hacked at the roots like Mr. Lau, though I was sending soothing mind beams to the tree as I did so, which I'm guessing Mr. Lau was not. Reference aforementioned turtle tail. <laughs> After I got a few good cut-ins, I like shoots that are connected to a larger, well-rooted piece of wood. I took them to the bucket near the house, filled it up, dropped them in, and showered and dressed for the funeral of a beloved 20-year-old child named Rachel who fell to her death a few nights ago. <clears throat> when my partner told me about Rachel's death, I was away, it was on the phone. She told me two butterflies alighted on the butterfly bush we just planted. When we were standing in the back corner of the funeral home during the eulogies, I moved there because I'm tall and called Stephanie over so we could listen together. Stephanie caught sight of a little silver gleaming thing on the ground. <clears throat> When the eulogy was over, she picked it up, a single elephant earring. Elephants were Rachel's favorite animal. She adored them. When we got home, after the pizza and guacamole, my guacamole, another delight. Another delight, here's the recipe, avocado, onion, garlic, salt. Really? I grabbed the bucket, trimmed the little trees into sticks, potted them in the plastic bags, and set them on the counter, where they sat there like promises like little converters, little dreamers of coming back into bloom, and how we might carry that with us wherever we go. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm gonna read you this poem <clears throat> called To the Mulberry Tree. Um, because, I don't know. I like to read about trees. <clears throat> this, has everyone eaten uh, mulberries? Who, who has not eaten mulberries? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's amazing. There's lots of mulberry trees growing around Philadelphia. They'll be ripe in like June. Maybe we'll have a field trip. <laughs> to the mulberry tree. <clears throat> Everyone knows it's good luck, if inconvenient, when a bird shits on you. 
But even more so, good luck if the bird shits on you when you're plucking gold current tomatoes sweet enough to make your bare feet lift just so off the ground. And the beetles beneath scurry and giggle. And as I move to gobble one, mouth agape and swooped in a grin at once, the shit slurries half in and half on my sun-warmed chin. Which, you know, I read this poem not too long ago, and some guy came up after it and was like, that happened to me too. <laughs> I thought it would never happen in my life. Half in and half on my sun-warmed chin, which, forgive me, jiggles me from my reverie, for I am only human, swiping the slurp of turd from my mouth, only to see it is mostly purple, the goop seedy and gelatinous. And when I see the bird pitching its swill from the branch above, I know that, yes, this shit is mostly buried from that most prolific of trees, which some numbskulls call a weed because it's so prolific and not, they say, particularly useful. These same some call insipid the mulberry's flavor, which I think means tasteless or bland. But given I detect swirled in the shit, the sweet of the thing, insipid doesn't fit the bill, but rather most likely describes the sex life of the describer. But <laughs> why should I get personal? <laughs> Defending a tree's honor. Mostly I'm happy the birds feast on the topmost branches of these tall trees and leave be for the time being my blueberries and soon blackberries and grapes and these little tomatoes. Though to be sure, it is a certain glee as spring gasps into summer and the lowest branches shimmer with their simple booty, which I must jump for and sometimes high, which I will not probably always be able to do for jumping and grabbing at once like this. A soft thing is hard. Be gentle, she said, emerging from the dugout beneath the mulberry tree where the big kids gathered, and we mostly rode our bikes by fast so as not to be snatched to the ground and pummeled, or worse, for they were teenagers. But I knew this early July morning they would be nowhere to be found, and the tree would be burdened with a crop begging to be loosed on my ice cream. She wiped her eyes and yawned and put on glasses, and there was in her hair a small sprig of grass, and she was barefoot, laughing and filling with me slowly my bucket, eating a few when it was full, giggling at the small burst of juice one made on her chin. And behind her, beneath the tree, there was a filthy blanket and a pack of cigarettes and tinfoil wrappers crumpled and shimmering in the frayed remnants of a rope. And seeing me seeing into the terrible future, she put softly one hand on my chin and the other in my hair, turning my head away from what wreckage waited in there and back into the leaves, which I will do to you as well, so that none of us will ever die terribly, but stay always like this, lips and fingers blushed purple, the faint sugar ghosting our mouths beneath the tree inside me, which is now the same tree grown inside you. All of us snugged in the canopy on our tippy toes, gathering fruit for good. <clears throat> Um, this, I'm going to read like one more of these delights and then I'm going to read a more last poem. Um, <clears throat> are you doing okay? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Um, I'm sorry, it's taking me a second to find this one. Um, Okay. This one is called <laughs> This one is called Just a Dream. <clears throat> and it you know, it would help like I feel like the, it starts with a kind of inside joke, but maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what these things are doing, which is why I beg your forgiveness. Just a Dream. <clears throat> Among the things I have learned from Montaigne, I'm a little surprised I just wrote that. Is that the word essay which I knew me meant attempt or try, also means trial. I gleaned this from one of the essays, trials, in my Penguin Classics I scooped from a used bookstore, I'm not sure where. I think it's in the one called On Books, which is on books. Titling for Montaigne, I'm guessing, was not a trial. It's a nice and honest, sometimes brutally so, assessment of what I imagined was the canon of the day, most of which remains in the canon of ours. 
Plato, Cicero, Virgil. He might mention Homer, Seneca. He finds both Cicero and Plato to be dull and long-winded, spending too much plotting time getting to their points. Virgil, he adores and think, thinks his Georgics the finest poem ever written. I love the Georgics too, so it makes me glad to know I'm in good company that way. But I don't think Montaigne would like this effort, as it's only been warm-up. Maybe everything is always only warm-up. For what, though? One of the great delights of my life, when I get to do it, is staring into the ceiling or closet from my bed, or looking at the slats of light coming into the room, or the down of dust hovering on the blinds, recalling my dreams. Sometimes they are prominent and clear, like the other night when I was to be Hillary Clinton's vice president. <clears throat> I was still me, and was writing something on the board in a classroom where I was teaching a class, and thinking to myself, she's got the wrong guy. <laughs> I'm not cut out for this. I was thinking of my tendency toward panic and paranoia, and how that might not be suitable for someone who's second in command. Though I gave her a big hug for being the first female nominee, the first female president, congratulating her, and silently thinking, how could I get out of this? <laughs> Which is maybe one of the themes, not the primary one by any stretch of the imagination, of my dream life. How can I get out of this? Which explains all the airplanes falling from the sky, the tornadoes and plays in which I have the lead but haven't studied the lines, the last football games I'm supposed to get to but can't, stuck in traffic in my uniform. A few years ago, I had a dream in which I had been fucking my mother for about two years. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't actually live through, dream through, the fucking part, but instead just woke up in the dream to the fact that for the past two years, is to a significant number, I had been fucking my mother. Just as you would if you just realized you've been fucking your mother for the past two years, I lost my shit. <clears throat> I was pacing around and renting, hyperventilating, thinking, how could I have been fucking my mother for the past two years? Mind you, this wasn't an Oedipal faux pas, which, as far as I'm concerned, is completely forgivable and understandable. He was fucked from the start, and the blind man told him so. As I recall, in the dream, maybe my mother and I were to meet up later, or she was on her way over. A date? <laughs> when it occurred to me that something fucking my mother for the past two years, was not okay. <laughs> what have I done? What have I done, I thought. In writing this, I will commend myself for not, in the dream, blaming my poor mother, my dear poor mother, who was also a party to the depravity. I've had other terrible dreams. The one where I murdered someone and then invited people over, Super Bowl. The severed head sitting behind the chair as we chatted over root beer. And other terrible fucking dreams, too. One with a certain colleague comes to mind. But you, might imagine, <laughs> but you might imagine that none was as terrible as the one where I'd been fucking my mother for two years. And very few things have been as delightful as when I woke from that dream, let out a groan, shook off the grossness, and shouted, thank you, thank you, to no one but me. Your enthusiasm makes me think you've also dreamt of fucking your mother. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I always <laughs> my mom reads my poems. <laughs> mm. Okay. I'm going to read this poem called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Yeah. It's going to take like 10 minutes. Actually, rest for a second. Do you need a stretch or anything? <laughs> Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. That's enough. <clears throat> okay. So there's two things that you should know about this poem. One is that like Brooke mentioned, um, I, I have worked for the past handful of years with uh, this community orchard in Bloomington. It's called the Bloomington Community Orchard. It was sort of the brainchild of this uh, person named Amy Countryman. And then she sort of gathered a bunch of people around her. And we all, this, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people pitched in to sort of make this thing, which is thriving. If you're ever in Bloomington, Indiana, find the Bloomington Community Orchard. There's free fruit. Um, the other thing is that I mentioned a kid, an idea of a kid who's now a kid, a real kid. 
She's like a three-year-old child named Era Lee. <clears throat> That's all you need to know. Except it's fun to say that the... It's fun to read these poems where Philadelphia happens in Philadelphia. That feels nice. I think Fairmount and 18th is here. Friends! It's called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. Friends, will you bear with me today? For I have awakened from a dream in which a robin made with its shabby wings a kind of veil behind which it shimmied and stomped something from the south of Spain, its breast a flare looking me dead in the eye from the branch that grew into my window, coochie-cooing my chin. The birds shuffling its little talons left, then right, while the leaves bristled against the plaster wall, two of them drifting onto my blanket while the bird opened and closed its wings like a matador, giving up on murder. Judding its beak, turning a circle and flashing again the ruddy bombast of its breast by which I knew upon waking it was telling me in no uncertain terms to bellow forth the tubas and sousaphones, the whole rusty brass band of gratitude not quite dormant in my belly. It said so in a human voice. Bellow forth! And who among us could ignore such odd and precise counsel? Hear ye! Hear ye, I am here to holler that I have hauled tons, by which I don't mean lots, I mean tons, of cow shit, and stood ankle deep in swales of maggots swirling the spent beer grains the brewery man was good enough to dump off, holding his nose, for they smell very bad, but make the compost writhe giddy and lick its lips, twirling dung with my pitchfork again and again with hundreds and hundreds of other people. We dreamt an orchard this way, furrowing our brows and hauling our wheelbarrows and sweating through our shirts. And less than a year later, there was a party at which were sunk into the well-fed earth. Trees were sunk into the well-fed earth, one of which, a liberty apple, after being watered in, was tamped by a baby barefoot with a bow, hanging in her hair, biting her lip in her joyous work. And friends, this is the realest place I know. It makes me squirm like a worm. I am so grateful. You could ride your bike there, roller skate, or catch the bus. There's a fence and a gate twisted by hand. There's a fig tree taller than you in Indiana. It will make you gasp. It might make you want to stay alive even. Thank you. And thank you for not taking my pal when the engine of his mind dragged him to swig fistfuls of Xanax and a bottle or two of booze. And thank you for taking my father a few years after his own father went down. Thank you, mercy, mercy. Thank you for not smoking meth with your mother. Oh, thank you. Thank you for leaving and for coming back. And thank you for what inside my friend's love bursts like a throng of roadside goldenrod gleaming into the world, likely hauling a shovel with her like one named Era Lee Ott, with hands big as a horse's, and who, like one named Era Lee Ott, will laugh time to time till the juice runs from her nose. Oh, thank you for the way a small thing's wail makes the milk or what once was milk in us gather into horses huckle buckling across a field. And thank you, friends, when last spring the hyacinth bells rang and the crocuses flaunted their upturned skirts and a quiet roved the beehive, which when I entered were snugged two or three fist-sized clutches of bees between the frames, <clears throat> almost clinging to one another. This one's tiny head pushed into another's tiny wing, one's forelegs resting on another's face the translucent paper of their wings fluttering beneath my breath, and when a few dropped to the frames beneath, honey, and after falling down to cry, everything's glacial shine. And thank you, too. And thanks for the corduroy couch I have put you on. That might actually be corduroy, is it? <clears throat> it is! Hot damn! <clears throat> put your feet up. Here's a light blanket, a pillow dear ones, for I think this is going to be long. I can't stop my gratitude, which includes, dear reader, you for staying here with me, for moving your lips just so as I speak. Here is a cup of tea. I've spooned honey into it. And thank you, the tiny bee's shadow perusing these words as I write them. And the way my love talks quietly when in the hive, so quietly, in fact, you cannot hear her, but only notice barely her lips moving in conversation. Thank you what does not scare her in me, but makes her reach my way. 
Thank you, the love she is, which hurts sometimes. And the time she misremembered elephants in one of my poems, which, oh, here they come. Garlanded with morning glory and wisteria blooms, trombones all the way down to the river. Thank you, the quiet in which the river bends around the elephant's solemn trunk, polishing stones floating on its gentle back, the flock of geese flying overhead. And to the quick and gentle flocking of men to the old lady falling down on the corner of Fairmount and 18th holding patiently with the softest parts of their hands her cane and purple hat, gathering for her the contents of her purse and touching her shoulder and elbow. And thank you to the cockeyed basketball court on which in a half court three on three, we old heads made of some runny nose kids a shambles. And the 61 year old after flipping a reverse layup off a backdoor cut from my no look pass to seal the game, ripped off his shirt and threw punches at the gods and hollered at the kids to admire the pacemaker's scar grinning across his chest. <laughs> Thank you, the glad accordions wheeze in the chest. Thank you, the bagpipes. Thank you to the woman barefoot in a gaudy dress for stopping her car in the middle of the road and the tractor trailer behind her and the van behind it, whisking a turtle off the road. Thank you, God of Gaudy. Thank you, Paisley Panties. Thank you, the organ up my dress. Thank you, the sheer dress you wore kneeling in my dream at the creek's edge and the light swimming through it. The coy kissing halos into the glassy air. The room in my mind with the blinds drawn where we nearly injure each other, crawling into the shawl of the other's body. And thank you when I just say it plain, we fuck each other dumb. And you, again you, for the true kindness it has been for you to remain awake with me like this, nodding time to time, and making that noise which I take to mean, yes, or I understand, or please go on, but not too long. <laughs> or easy, tiger, hands to yourself. I am excitable, I'm sorry. I'm grateful. I just want us to be friends now, forever. Take this bowl of blackberries from the garden. The sun has made them warm. I picked them just for you. I promise I will try to stay on my side of the couch. And thank you the baggie of dreadlocks I found in a drawer while washing and folding the clothes of our murdered friend. The photo in which his arm slung around the sign to the trail of silences. Thank you the way before he died he held his hands open to us for coming back in a waft of incense or in the shape of a boy in another city looking from between his mother's legs or disappearing into the stacks after brushing by for moseying back in dreams where seeing us lost and scared he put his hand on our shoulders and pointed us to the temple across town. And thank you to the man all night long hosing a mist on his early bloomed peach trees so that the hard frost not waste the crop, the ice in his beard and the ghosts lifting from him when the warming sun told him, sleep now. Thank you, the ancestor who loved you before she knew you by smuggling seeds into her braid for the long journey, who loved you before he knew you by putting a walnut tree in the ground, who loved you before she knew you by not slaughtering the land. Thank you, who did not bulldoze the ancient grove of dates and olives, who sailed his keys into the ocean and walked softly home, who did not fire, who did not plunge the head into the toilet, who said, stop, don't do that, who lifted some broken someone up, who volunteered volunteered the way a plant birthed of the reseeding plant we call a volunteer, like the plum tree that marched beside the raised bed in my garden, like the arugula that marched itself between the blueberries, nary a bayonet, nary an army, nary a nation, which usage of the word volunteer familiar to gardeners the wide world made my pal shout, oh, and dance and plunge his knuckles into the lush soil before gobbling two strawberries and digging a song from his guitar made of wood from a tree someone may be planted. Thank you. And thank you, Zinnia and Gooseberry, Rebecca. Becky and Papa, Ashmead's Colonel and Coxcomb and Scarlet Runner, Feverfew and Lemon Balm. Thank you, Knitbone and Sweetgrass and Sunchoke and False Indigo, whose petals stammered apart by bumblebees. Good Lord, please give me a minute.
and Moonglow and Catkin and Crookneck and Painted Tongue and Seed Pod and Johnny Jump Up. Thank you, What In Us Rackets Glad, What Glad Rackets Us. And thank you to this knuckleheaded heart, this pelican heart, this gap tooth heart flinging open its gaudy maw to the sky. Oh, clumsy, oh, bumblefucked, oh, giddy, oh, dumbstruck, oh, rickshaw, oh, goat twisting its head at me from my peach tree's highest branch, balanced and possibly gobbling the last fruit, its tongue working like an engine, a lone sweet drop tumbling by some miracle into my mouth like the smell of someone I've loved. Heart like an elephant screaming at the bones of its dead. Heart like the lady on the bus dressed head to toe in gold. The sun shivering her shiny boots singing Erica Badu to herself leaning her head against the window. And thank you to the way my father one time came back in a dream by plucking the two cables beneath my chin like a bass fiddle strings. And he played me until I woke singing. No kidding, I was singing and smiling. Thank you. Thank you, stumbling into the garden where the Juneberry's flowers had burst open like the bells of French horns. The lily my mother and I planted, it oozed into the air. The Brazilian ants labored in their earthen workshops below. The collard greens, they waved in the wind like the sails of ships. And the wasps swam in the mint bloom's viscous swill. And you, again you, for hanging tight, dear friends. I know I can be long-winded sometimes. I just want so badly to rub the sponge of gratitude over every last thing, including you, which is awkward. <laughs> the little soap going behind your glasses or down your shirt. Soon it will be over, <clears throat> which is precisely what the child in my dream said, holding my hand, pointing at the roiling sea in the sky, hurtling our way like so many buffalo, who said, it's much worse than we think, and sooner. To whom I said, no duh, child in my dreams. What do you think this singing and shuddering is? What this screaming and reaching and dancing and crying is other than loving what every second goes away? Goodbye, I mean to say, and thank you every day. Thank you. Ross Gay, everybody, Ross Gay. Thank you, Ross, amazing reading. Um, so we are having a reception in the back. There are copies of the book from which Ross read extensively tonight. So if you buy a copy, I'm sure he'll want to inscribe it. He'll probably hang here for a few minutes, but give him a chance to get to the reception. And, hang out with us. And once, once more, we need to thank the Sussman Morris family for making this event possible. <laughs> and thank you, Brooke, for being a, such an old friend of this guy, so it made it easier for us to invite him and have him hang out for a second time. I think she was very moved by that poem. Yeah. So, and once more, thank you to Ross Gay. <laughs>